Welcome to today's Webmaster Central Office Hours Hangout. Um, I hope you guys had a good weekend so far. Yes. Well, so far. And ready for a good week? Yes, sir. Perfect. All right. Um, let me just copy things around. Oh, well, and <laughs> if anyone wants to, feel free to jump on in and ask the first question. I have a quick question, if I may. Sure. Mm -hmm. Go for it. Um, I know last Monday um, someone asked about some uh, some webmaster tools errors, and they are really going after each one, uh, several errors or not found or so for force and everything. And um, I have a problem. I have a screenshot that I might share if that's okay. Okay. And uh, I was just curious if because there are a lot of uh, errors within uh, Webmaster Tools on uh, on this one. And uh, with this number, is this really something we should focus on and set on priority number one? Or that's a lot of server errors. Does this yeah. influence well, in any way? The numbers are really high. I've never seen anything like this. That's a lot of server errors, yeah. So what we, I we, we have it on the priority, but it's not really on the top of the list. Should we push it in the top of the list? So that what, is, that's what kind of pages are those? Yes. Are they like important pages that are sometimes showing a server error, or are they pages that are basically not found? Uh, no, the website has a really large amount of pages. Mm -hmm. And uh, usually the strategy is to pull them into the index. If they're all they pulling them out, deleting them, actually set them on 410 or 404 sometimes. Uh, I didn't go too much into the server errors, but it doesn't look like it's, uh, it's a big issue at this point. And anyway, the site errors are not there. So from that point of view, I would say it's, it's safe. But still, the number is really large, and I was just wondering if that could influence somehow overall the, the site performance in any way. So I think in a case like this, I try to see why they're returning server errors. Because if these are just pages that are basically don't exist anymore, then they should be returning 404 or 410, for example. They shouldn't be returning server errors. Because server errors usually really a sign that there's something happening that the server didn't expect. So I try to figure out what exactly was happening there. Why, when Googlebot crawled, did we see a server error instead of a 404 or 410, for example, if the content was actually removed? So in, in a case like that, Basically, I I've reviewed some of the, the, the server errors page. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, there is a delay, and that's why I'm overlapping. I think in, in a case like this, I try to really reduce the number of server errors. And if they, are all, if they all end up being 404 or 410, for example, then that's fine. But uh, server errors on their own probably aren't really that great there. So I think one thing that might even be happening is if we see a lot of these server errors, that we might crawl a little bit uh, slower because we think maybe through our crawling frequency we are causing these server errors. So it's something that might even be reflected there. Let's see. And, uh, time spent on a page, if that matters in any way, it's, uh, it's around 600. I would say it's, it's decent enough. Well, yeah. I I think that's something that you'd want to look at separate from the technical side of things. So I really try to see if you can fix those server errors, or at least make them return the proper result code. I also want to add something. Uh, if uh, I got a warning from one of my clients that Googlebot cannot crawl uh, your site, even though I checked with GoDaddy, everything was fine on their end, and now this site is kind of like removed and I did the fetch Google bot thing and on, on on Saturday and then I saw that you guys did another update on Sunday but still would the site come back to itself? I'm kinda worried. Yeah. 
That should definitely okay, come because back. Because it says Google Bot cannot crawl your sub, but everything's fine, John. I made sure everything's below zero millisecond, like the loading time. It's got a mobile website. Like everything is top notch with that, you know? And are you seeing Google Bot in your server logs? Yeah. Yeah, it's it's um, it fetched it. Everything's fine. It said success or whatever, but when when should I see it back to normal? Um, so usually, if uh, there is a problem that we can't actually crawl your website, then usually there is a quite long time before you would see any change in like in the search results performance, because what will happen there is that primarily we'll kind of slow or stop crawling the site, and then in a second step we'll start losing some of these URLs because we can't crawl them again. So it's not something that if we can't crawl some of your pages today that your site won't show up in search at all. It's something that really has a kind of a long latency before you see the actual effects. So if uh, you received that message just recently and you're kind of sure that for the largest part we can crawl your site normally, yeah. and the changes in ranking that you're seeing are probably due to something else. Really? Everything was fine on uh, after the penguin thing. OK. Um, it's really hard to say without looking into the specifics. But uh, especially if it's something where you feel that the site isn't ranking, kind of like, like it used to be. So for example, the home page isn't showing up for these queries anymore, then usually that's not due to a technical issue. That's more okay, because I got kind a warning. Of it, was a that Google, it was a warning that Google bot couldn't crawl your site. That's there was no other warnings. Yeah, so that's that's more a technical issue that we couldn't reach your server, for example. That or th there were lots of uh, unreachable requests that basically failed trying to reach your site. But if your pages are still indexed normally and they're just not ranking where they used to be, then that wouldn't be due to this technical issue. Okay. OK, let's look at the moderator. Let's see what we have here. Um, here we go. Inorganic links. Must we remove do follow links that we had nothing to do with? And some examples here. Um, they're basically just examples. So essentially, if your site is getting a link from a third party website and it's not with a no follow and it's essentially something that you have nothing to do with, then usually those are normal organic links. And those are the kind of links that you want to keep. So it's not something that you'd want to remove. Um, let me just look at one of these examples. Um, the visit site link here. So this looks like a kind of a website review site where they're pulling in all kinds of information there. So I think something like that is, is a normal link. That's not something that I'd really worry about. Yeah, I know that website. It's just uh, kind of like a, like you said, a review site profile. Yeah. So. Essentially, those are the kind of things you wouldn't need to worry about, especially if you had nothing to do with that, if those links aren't advertising, if those links aren't tied to any kind of exchange from your site that you're kind of like trading one link for another link, or that you're paying for this link somehow, then that's something you would need to And it's a no-follow anyways, right? Oh, I didn't even check. Yeah. OK, so if it's no-follow then. Especially if it's a no-follow, then you basically don't don't have to worry about that because we wouldn't take that into account for our ranking algorithms. Yeah. I have a personal Google Plus account as an individual and two pages under that account for each of my businesses. Is it possible to make the Google Plus business pages an author? So from our side, we basically differentiate between the personal Google Plus profile and the Google Plus pages in that a personal profile can be an author, and a Google Plus page can be a publisher. So essentially, the business 
would be the publisher of this website, of all of the articles on this website, and the author, the personal page, would be the individual person for the individual piece of content. So you can add both of those to your website to kind of um, really tie in these two Google Plus um, parts, so the personal profile and the business pages to your website. Um, but you can't make a business page act as an author. John, can I follow up on that question? Sure. If I put both authorship and publisher, which icon will show up in the search? The publisher or the author? Usually we'd show the author in the search results, but uh, we try to find a balance there so that we're not overloading the search results. So it's something where we try to show the author, but we wouldn't guarantee that we'd always show the author. But you would never show the publisher? As far as I know, we don't show the publisher. OK, thank you. Uh, at least I'm not aware of any case where we'd show that directly. Martin's saying uh, those, that profile was a do follow, but I see it as a no follow on my end. So I don't know. OK about that profile thing so you guys would still penalize those uh... no I think I think those would be fine yeah I think either way would be fine if, if they were a no follow then that'd be something you wouldn't even need to worry about and if they're do follow and they're basically like that then it's not something you need to spend a lot of time on okay it's a visit site link at the top that yeah I'm showing do follow to me Okay. I have no follow plugin that highlights no follow links. Um, well, let's double check. Um, yeah, it looks looks like a normal link as far as I can tell. All right, next question in the moderator page. And as always, feel free to ask more questions in between, add comments, or add more questions to the Google moderator if you're listening along. Inorganic links. Do we have to remove links from scraper sites? They're impossible to contact, but showing up in Webmaster Tools. Uh, if you could remove this entire site, that would be appreciated. Um, so generally, if this is like a, a content scraper and they're copying your content, then you might also consider looking into the DMCA complaint uh, there and seeing if that's something you can submit there to that website or to the hoster. It depends a bit on the specific situations there. But in general, if this is something that we recognize as being a spammy site where we see a lot of these kind of problematic links going in and out, and that's something we probably ignore from our side. So if you've seen that these are inorganic links pointing at your site, and if you've tried to have those removed, then I generally wouldn't uh, lose much sleep over that. If you have something associated with your site that's tied to unnatural links, uh, maybe a manual action against your site that you've seen in the reconsideration request, for example, then I definitely document that and say, OK, I found the links here. I tried to contact the webmaster, but I wasn't able to actually get any response from the webmaster, for example. And usually that helps the web spam team kind of understand what you've done to try to remove these inorganic links pointed to your site. Um, I hear you'll be discontinuing the standalone plus one reports on November 14th. Are you talking about uh, Google Webmaster Tools? Um, and link to blog posts. So what we're basically doing is removing the standalone plus one reports in Webmaster Tools. But uh, the plan is to make sure that we have this similar kind of information available in analytics. So I'm not sure if that's something that's going to be copied one to one in analytics. But uh, at least this is something that we're planning to kind of consolidate together there. So it's not something that's going to be going away for good. 
Um, is it good practice to show full blog posts on the blog homepage? For example, googleblog.blogspot.com. Um, it's something you can do. So some sites uh, show the full blog post. Other sites show an excerpt. Uh, ultimately, that's something that's kind of up to you, how you want to handle that on your site. And uh, one thing that I think kind of plays a role as well is how you handle comments, for example. So if you have comments on your, on your blog, then those are going to be additional kind of content sources available on the individual blog post page that you won't find on the home page directly. So that kind of helps to balance things out. But even without comments, I believe the official Google blog doesn't have comments. Check. Then it's definitely fine to keep the full post on the home page. That's something that we try to find a balance between showing the home page in the search results and showing the direct blog post link. How do you guys handle it? Full post or excerpt? But wouldn't that be an issue with cannibalization at some point? Um, to a large extent, since on the home page, it has a number of posts. It's not just one individual post. That's something that we kind of deal with on that level. So if we see that there is a kind of a long list of posts on the home page, and we can compare that to the individual post page, where basically is just the content in a concentrated form, then we can try to find a balance there. And if someone is searching, for example, for something that's in the first post, combined with something that's in the second post, then the home page might be the right place to send them to. Whereas if something is specifically searching for something that's only mentioned in the second post, then maybe the second post will be kind of like shown directly in search results. Is that more or less what you went there? Yep. All right. Let's see, how should I mark authorship on the site that has been edited by more than one member? Imagine a wiki page that was edited by more than one person. So essentially, for authorship, you can mark up a page to have multiple authors. But uh, it's really helpful for us with regards to what we show in search results if we have the one main author marked up. So in order for something to be kind of eligible to be shown in search, we have to have one author for that. And if you have multiple authors on that, then I imagine it'll be hard for us to pick one of these profiles to show. So if uh, you have a page that's really kind of uh, um, grew out of teamwork, out of all of these team members, and that's something it's fine to mark up with multiple authors. But if you have a page that is primarily written by one person and just has like small edits by other people, then I try to mark that up as being written by that one primary author. All right. How should webmasters compete with sites placed above mine based on large numbers of network links? How about competing with authority sites which can rank with no content other than the headline? Is the balance between relevance and quality in equilibrium? Um, so generally speaking, that's something that I think always comes up from time to time that uh, some sites are just uh, very large and well-known, and they sometimes show up for queries where maybe they don't have the absolute best content. But that's something where our algorithms try to find a balance between something that is large and well-known and other content that is specifically kind of matches this query and matches the intent of the user. So it's something where we try to find a balance as much as possible. If you guys run into situations where you see it uh, really being the case that we're showing uh, some totally irrelevant content from a website where you think that maybe this is only being shown because this website is well known, then that's something that I'd recommend kind of bubbling up back to us. So you can do that either with the feedback link on the bottom of the search results, or you can also contact us directly and send us the query that you did, uh, kind of a sample of the results that you saw and what you think was really bad about this uh, set of results. 
And sometimes what we can do there is really take that to the uh, search quality engineers and go through that query specifically and see, OK, what went wrong here? What can we do better? Which part of our algorithm do we have to tune a little bit to make sure that we're kind of weighing the factors appropriately? And with the over 207 factors that we use in crawling, indexing, and ranking, it's something that you can imagine is constantly being fine-tuned. All right, and uh, as always, you guys are welcome to ask more questions in between. But uh, I can also go through the moderator questions here. Whatever works for you. Um, Buyagift.co.uk has faceted navigation. The filter lets us reach similar product listings via many routes. So for example, skydiving Manchester 100 pounds, or Manchester skydiving 100 pounds. And the same content with different URLs. We have thousands of URLs for the same pages. What's the best way to fix for user and crawler? So generally, in a case like this, I try to use things like the rel canonical which really helps us to kind of combine these different URLs into something that's uh, a preferred URL that you'd like to have indexed in the search results. Other things that you could do is consider maybe using JavaScript to create this faceted navigation, uh, which might make it a little bit easier in that uh, we only have one set of URLs to actually crawl and index. Those are probably the best ways to kind of handle that. One thing you might want to kind of keep an eye on as well is how many URLs we can actually crawl from your website per day. And uh, at some point, Googlebot is going to kind of slow down with crawling because we're afraid that your server might not be able to handle that load. And especially if your server is kind of running on the edge there, then I'd recommend trying to find ways that you can either reduce the number of URLs that we find or making sure that the server is really strong enough to be able to handle the load of us crawling all of these individual URLs. So it's something where you kind of have to find a balance on your own uh, between making your website in a way that we don't run across all of these uh, unnecessary duplication URLs and uh, being able to actually crawl all of them. All right, uh, Google algorithm update mentioned there were both Panda and page quality updates in August and September. What's the difference between the two? Um, I'm not aware of the specifics there in, uh, in what we posted there. So I'd have to look that up first. Is that something you guys are following? Absolutely, yeah. Absolutely, OK. Um, I, I know we post a lot of uh, the different updates uh, on those uh, summary blog posts, but sometimes it's hard to track back exactly what the specifics were there. Um, what can I do to avoid Panda? Um, so generally speaking, Panda is a page quality kind of an algorithm. And the best thing that I'd recommend doing if you're kind of worried about your site being affected by Panda is going through the 23 questions blog post that uh, Amit Singhal made last year, and uh, maybe even finding someone who's uh, unaffiliated directly with your website and going through those questions after they have uh, tried to work around on your website, maybe complete some kind of task. And quite often, you'll get some feedback back from that, which really kind of helps you to understand a little bit better where maybe the quality of the website, the quality of the content isn't quite at the level that you'd want it to be. So it's something where there wouldn't be a specific technical issue that you'd have to tackle to kind of get that resolved. Google always told us not to put much uh, energy in EMDs because it would not be worth the time and money since quality matters most to the algorithm. Then why was there an algo change needed? It was supposed to do so already, wasn't it? So EMD is exact match domain, which is essentially if you create a website that uh, 
where the keywords that you're primarily targeting are exactly mentioned in the domain name. So, I had yeah. a smarty pants, like a customer who was a smarty pants, said, well, you know, I'm just going to go to that famous hosting company and buy all these, uh, you know, exact match domains and I don't need, you know, I'll rank, you watch, you know, blah, blah, blah. And then now all his sites are gone. Okay. Yeah. It's, like 50 of them. It's something where the just because it matches the keywords, it's not something that would necessarily be a problem because you can definitely imagine that a site like Google Webmaster Central it has Google Webmaster Central uh, in the domain name or in the host name at least. Um, but especially if we notice that these are low quality sites and we see that there are just a ton of them that are basically like doorway pages, then that's yeah. something that we take action on. That's something we've always kind of taken action on and something that the algorithm has tried to recognize as much as possible. But uh, as things evolve on the web, it's something that we have to evolve on our side as well. And we kind of work to make sure that uh, quality kind of stays at the level that we'd want. So it's not just having a domain name that matches the keyword. It's really the all of the issues around having sites like that where the quality is really low, and you're basically just targeting specific keywords to trying to get them to rank for those specific keywords and not making a website for the broader uh, yeah. market that you're focusing on. So we see I, that. I, Go ahead. I understand that, but I understand that, but that's, that's what you always told us, that, that uh, there was no big advantage in exact man match domains, and now suddenly there was a uh, an advantage large enough to, to have a special algo change for it? Well, it's something where we always try to kind of update our algorithms as we see that things are, are necessary. So it's not something where we'd say, OK, this, this uh, kind of technique has been available to spammers for one year now, and there's something that they're making lots of money with, so we have to make an algorithm specifically for that. It's something where our engineers are basically working constantly to improve things, and sometimes they're able to make kind of visible steps in improving the quality in that regard. And that's more or less what's happening here. It's not that we said this specific issue has to be handled by a specific algorithm. It's just that. This is something we've been working on for a while. And at some point, they make a bigger step to kind of um, handle some of the issues that we might not have uh, been able to handle as well in the past. But is it actually EMD or also PMD, partial? <laughs> partial match. Um, I, I don't know the specifics. So it's. It's really hard to say exactly what's happening there, but uh, primarily the, the big issue that we found is that when, when it's tied to something that's really of low quality, then uh, I imagine like even partial matches could be kind of a problem. Because I saw some debates about only having one keyword in the domain name, but still. Can you give us an example, John, like uh, with maybe like pizza? Pizza. So oh, I mean, pizza. Pizza Toronto. One thing that I've seen a lot, like posting in the in the help send, help form, is when sites have, for example, all of these city names. So basically, you have Pizza Toronto and then Pizza Toronto for some suburb of Tom Toronto, and like hundreds of these uh, kind of like low quality doorway sites. And that's something that we uh, probably see as being like a low quality domain. So it's a lot about doorway pages. Well, it's it's similar to doorway pages. So to some extent, doorway pages are things that we look at primarily from a manual point of view, where we kind of like uh, try to see which, which of these sites belong together and uh, say, OK, well, you'd probably be better off focusing all of your energy on one site instead of on all of these separate sites. So that's something that kind of comes together. Okay, but at the moment, everybody seems to think they are being hurt by the new algo uh, just because they have uh, uh, exact match domains. Uh, perhaps you, you could explain a little bit more why that isn't. <laughs> well, we use 
I mean, we use a lot of factors in our algorithm. So it's something that uh, is really kind of hard to tie back and say this was due to this exact issue. But uh, generally speaking, if you're seeing kind of a, a drop in the search performance of your website, then I'd really recommend going through all of the possible issues that might be affecting your website and not just focusing on the domain name, for example. So usually, in cases like that, it's not a matter of saying, OK, well, I'll choose a domain name that's not an exact match for my keywords, because there's just so many other factors that are around this website and maybe the low quality content on and around the website that are play is playing a role there. So it's not something where I primarily focus on the domain name there, but really take a step back and look at the website overall. Like people are not stupid anymore, you know. Focus on the brand, right? Well, that's that's definitely a possibility. I mean, that's something that, uh, to some extent, can make sense for some websites. For other websites, it's a bit harder if they haven't been building up, say, their personal brand over time. Yeah, I mean, if they're calling and saying Pizza Toronto, and the guy's saying, "No, this is Richmond Hill Gino, you know, Pizza Pizzeria," and they're like, "Oh, we thought it was, you know, Pizza Toronto," they'll hang up. So I'm just giving examples from what my experience from the past, right? Sometimes it can also get out of hand, and you know, so you look like the the actual owner of the site looks not it's, presented well. Yeah, it, it's something where it probably makes sense to look at specific examples. Yeah, but I don't really want to kind of uh, discuss other people's websites in in the hangouts here when they're not around to kind of give us more context around that. So. It makes sense to me that the brand wouldn't be important for every business because not that's not how people always search, right, John? I mean, I'm just a mom in Colorado. I might be searching for a place to get kids' shoes. I don't know the brand, and I may not care about the brand names. I may just need to go get some winter shoes for my kids within a 20-mile radius at some point. So I don't think everyone can focus just on the brand. You can't have that kind of proliferation of just brand name exposure. You've got to write for what the people are looking for, too. Yeah. Yeah. But you I, can still do fine with the exact match domain if you have enough quality at least, right? Yeah. I mean, it's not something that if your domain name matches some of the keywords that you're targeting, that you'd automatically not show up in search anymore. Because uh, there are a lot of sites that target the keywords that uh, they have in their domain name, and that's fine. If that's like a high quality site, then why not? Yeah. Yeah, but like just like Ashley was saying, but what if uh, like that specific person uh, had a, a like a you know a really good site with a exact match domain, and then all of a sudden, you know, they drop? But because you guys actually gave that person a a really big boost uh, for for a long time for that keyword, and then now if it wasn't quality, but it the site looked quality, it's it's it would still drop. So that person, let's say, didn't have you know money for SEO or anything like that. And then I saw those kind of sites drop as well. They didn't have a really high quality site. If the only thing no, no, they had a high quality site. They had a, a quality site, a high quality site, but the actual authority behind it wasn't, you know, as authoritative as you want it to be. And then I saw usually, a drop. Usually, in those kind of cases, uh, if it's if it's something that. Um, let's see, what was a site that was ranking kind of well for something that's matching their domain name and they dropped because of this change. And it's really probably more likely due to the content or the way that our algorithms view the content and the quality of the website. OK. So that should be something where if it's really a high quality website and it has a domain name that matches the keywords, then that's not something that they would need to worry Hey, John, is there any sort of limit as to how many search results one brand can occupy for a single query in the top, I don't know, 30 or something like that? Do you know of any limit? Um, I don't think we have any limit there. So for a while, it was the case, I think, that we'd only show up to two results on, on one search results page from one website. but. Uh, what we found when we talked to the search quality engineers is that they're really 
kind of a, not in a situation that they'd say we want to keep a specific limit for the number of site uh, URLs that we show from one website, that sometimes it can vary. Sometimes it makes sense to show one from one site, and sometimes it makes sense to show a handful from the same website. So it's not something where we stick to a strict limit. But uh, it's also something that uh, we've been tuning over time. So I think in the last couple of months, we've been showing more search results from one website. And then we've kind of dialed that back a little bit over time now. So that's definitely something where we also kind of take the user feedback into account and see how users react to that. But you can imagine there are situations where if you're looking for a specific website, then it makes sense to show more results from that website, whereas uh, if you're looking for something more generic, then you probably just want to have one result from each of these web websites. All right, let's see what we have here. Two more questions on the moderator here. Uh, you mentioned before that theoretically a domain could be too toxic if marked by Penguin. Would you say that the likelihood increased if a domain was marked by both EMD and Penguin. So I think what Richard means here is that uh, if you have a chance to buy a domain name for a new website, and it's a domain name that uh, has done a lot of spammy things in the past, then it might not be something that you want to kind of use for your new website, just because of all the history that's associated with the website, the way our algorithms view uh, that domain name from the past history. From the past. And I think, to some extent, that's, that's definitely the case. So if you have uh, the chance to buy a domain name that really has a kind of long and complicated history, then you might want to think twice about actually using that domain name for something completely new. Whereas uh, if you have a chance to get a domain name that's fairly new or that's never been used before, or that has a reasonably uh, sane history, then that's probably less of a problem, less of something that you'd have to worry about. And with regards to the exact match domain and Penguin, I think the main problem here would really be more regarding like the history of the domain and not necessarily because of the exact match of the domain name keywords. So it's something where if you really see that a website has been kind of involved with a lot of spammy activities in the past, then it doesn't really matter if the domain name itself is an exact match or if it's just a generic random domain name. How long can a, a history you, you stick on a website? Uh, if, if you buy the new domain and you uh, put new content on it and you do a reconsideration request, and they grant it. Uh, will there still be a stroke behind your name, uh, or does it go away completely? Um, it depends a little bit on what was happening with the website in the past. So if primarily the, web, the problematic part of the website is something that was on the page itself, then by putting up your new website with the new content, that's something that's going to go away fairly automatically. So it might take an algorithm refresh or something like that, depending on what happened. If there was manual action that was taken because of the content on your website, then the reconsideration request will kind of help uh, resolve that. It's something that takes a little bit of time to uh, settle down again, maybe I don't know, a couple of weeks, something around that range. Whereas if the problematic part of the domain name was something that was off of the domain name, something maybe due to the links that were around there, maybe uh, something due to the overall history of the domain name, then that's something that's going to be a little bit harder to just overcome. So one example that we had in a Hangout a couple months back is someone bought a domain name that used to be an adult website that was an adult website for, I don't know, five or 10 years and where the owner of that website spread a lot of web spam all around, posted links in forums, on profile pages, everywhere to kind of promote this adult website. And they wanted to take that domain name and put a celebrity news website on that domain name. Great. And essentially, 
our algorithms were still kind of tied to all of this web spam on the one hand that was still associated with that domain name, and on the other hand, also all of this uh, adult problematic that was kind of associated with the domain name. And it was something where the webmaster, when they put up the website, they noticed, well, it's, it's not really showing up in search how they expected it. And uh, to a large extent, I think that's similar to kind of buying a business. When you go out and you buy a business that uh, used to have a really bad past, then you might put a, a, a really great business in there. But if someone looks at the history of your site or kind of remembers your domain name, your address, then they'll kind of remember the, the problematic side as well. So in that regard, it's something where I try to at least double check the history before you actually buy a domain name and use it for your website so that you don't accidentally run into these situations where you have to clean up a lot of issues that you don't really have time for most of the time. And uh, with regards to aging, it's something where if we find that uh, these links aren't relevant anymore, so maybe over a couple of years, these spammy links will kind of just uh, be ignored on, on the one hand from our side and on the other side. If you've been building up your website to be really high quality and well known, then that's something that won't be as important anymore, that you won't have to worry about. But it's not something where you can say from one week to the next, I don't want to have anything to do with my website's past. Because if you look out on the web, you'll still see all of these mentions of this website kind of tied together with uh, the spammy action that maybe the previous owner did. But in a few years, you could become completely clear again. Yeah, that's, that's definitely possible. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No lifetime. Uh, no. No. I mean, there's a limited number of domains out there, so it kind of has to recycle itself over time. And things that used to be very relevant now tend not to be a little bit less relevant over the course of time. So over a year or so, I imagine these things kind of dilute themselves and lose uh, relevance. Thank you. OK, let's check the chat. Ashley posted a nice thread to look at. Sorry, I've been polluting your chat. <laughs> OK, Martin has a question in the chat. What's the longest length for a manual penalty? Um, I don't know, actually. I know it's more than a year, but I'm not exactly sure how, how long the longest would be. But usually, this, this kind of question comes up with uh, people that say they resolved an issue on their website, or they know they have a kind of a manual action against their website, and they don't want to submit a reconsideration request because they think, oh, that might call more attention to my website, and I'll just get some other penalty. And that's not something you kind of have to worry about. So if you've really resolved an issue on your website, and you think that's the reason uh, for manual action against your website, then I definitely submit a reconsideration request just to have someone look at it. So and when you guys when you guys give that one year penalty um, after that one year, <coughs> excuse me, when the entire site comes out, just I mean you guys would give it you know really you'll bring it back to life, right? There's no like halfway fifty percent, sixty percent. I'll be a hundred percent, right? Um, well, there are different manual actions that can kind of be in involved there. And it might be that one of them expires after a year. Maybe one is still running. So it's not something where you'd see one date and suddenly everything pops back up. So it's really kind of uh, something, depending on what specifically was happening there with the website, uh, how uh, kind of problematic it was, then uh, some of that may resolve a little bit faster or might be a little bit stronger than other factors. So okay. it's not something where you can always say when it expires, it'll just pop up and uh, show back up in search results. And another thing that's kind of in tied to that is that uh, things change over time. So if something had a manual action for one year, for example, and that expires, it doesn't mean it'll show back up in the search results in the same place it was one year ago because other sites might have changed over time, yeah, sure, and yeah. uh, generally our algorithms change a lot over time. So 
it's something where essentially we want to kind of um, let things go back to the natural ranking more or less. And if other people notice that there's still a lot of spam happening here that's causing problems in the search results, then we'll definitely get that through a spam report and take another look at it again. So we, we try to let it uh, kind of come back to life naturally. Um, Ashley has a question. Are there penalties where the offenses are so egregious that uh, really no matter what, they'll be in the doghouse for X period of time? Um, it, I mean, there are definitely those kind of situations where we say this is so bad that we don't even want to crawl and index this content, where we remove the website completely and we don't even crawl and index it anymore. And uh, in those kind of situations, Usually, that's something where when the manual action expires, it'll just take a bit of time for us to actually start crawling it again. But if so, let's say they were, you know, they were, they were, they were horrible people for X period of time. They got kicked out, and without change of ownership, they decided to tra start changing their their path and doing something better. Would a reconsideration request actually help them in that case, or is there like, you know, what you guys really need a, a year in timeout? No. I mean, if the content is good and if we can see that they've uh, taken significant steps to kind of resolve those issues, then that's fine. Okay. That's, that's certainly okay. I mean, it's something where there's going to be a bit of time between when they submit a reconsideration request and when they see the action that was uh, kind of associated with that. On the one hand, because we have to manually process all of the reconsideration requests. On the other hand, it sometimes just takes a bit of time to kind of bubble back up into the search results normally. But uh, even if they've done something really bad, if they've been cloaking, I don't know, adult content to comic book search results, for example, or, or whatever, then that's something where if they clean that up, if they resolve it, if we can also kind of tell that they're not just resolving it just once to just uh, switch it back on again five minutes later, then that's something where we'll say, OK, that's, that's fine. OK, let's see. Another one from the moderator. The recent EMD update targets low quality EMDs. Can you offer any details about quality? I realize it may be difficult to be specific, but can you tell us uh, if it was off site, on site, or both? So, especially with regards to quality, it's not something where there's a, um, a specific technical point that you can point at and say, this is a specific quality issue that we have to resolve. It's something where our algorithms have to take into account a number of factors there. And those are things that could be on the site itself. They could be things that, that are off the site. So it's not something where there's any one issue that we look at with regards to quality. But most of the time, these are things where if you look at it uh, from taking a step back, you kind of see the patterns and you see what's happening there. Uh, can you be affected by a manual penalty and an algorithmic penalty at the same time? Um, yes. So essentially, the algorithms are not seen from our side as being penalties as such. They're just the ways that our algorithms see the relevance of your website. And it's definitely possible that uh, your website is affected by some manual action. And maybe the algorithms are also seeing that your site isn't that relevant and also kind of showing it a little bit lower in the search results than before. So it's definitely possible that uh, that can happen at the same time. How about two manual penalties at the same time? That's also definitely possible. I mean, uh, there are a lot of webmaster guidelines and a lot of ways that they could be kind of broken. So for example, it might be possible that your website has some hidden text on it. And on the other hand, it has some issues with regards to inorganic links. And both of those could be active on your website at the same time. OK, link to the moderator, just a second. That was the last question. Oh, wait, we have the other. Moderator page. Uh, what's better, sitemaps or RSS? Um, essentially, they're pretty similar. So, with sitemaps, 
you have an advantage that you can use the sitemaps extensions for images, news, videos, for example. Um, but otherwise, they're fairly similar to RSS feeds. Another difference is that usually with sitemaps, you include all of the URLs from your website, whereas RSS usually only has the last couple of URLs from your website. But if you're talking about the situation where a website essentially just gets new content over time, where the really old content doesn't get updated, then both of these will probably help us to discover that content directly. Is having an inorganic link changed from do follow to no follow an acceptable way of removing the inorganic nature of it? Yes. So if you change a problematic link to having a no follow, then that's absolutely fine by us. That's not something that we take into account from the algorithms. So for example, if you have an advertisement on someone else's website, and that was a problem in the past because uh, that link was maybe passing page rank, adding a nofollow to that link would be a good way to resolve that problem without actually removing that advertisement and that source of traffic to your website. All right, we ran out of questions. Rob has a There's question. one in the chat from Rob. OK. Um, are requests from SEO companies treated different than from normal webmasters? No. So basically, if we see a reconsideration request, we don't really kind of pay attention to who exactly is sending it, but we try to look at the content. So if we can see that the site owner or the SEO or whoever has taken significant steps to resolve the issues that were affecting the site, then that's great. That's all we need to know. OK. And what happens if a CO company has its own site completely according to the guidelines, and their customer websites are using doorways and that kind of things, because that company placed them there? Will that company be punished some way? way? Generally not, but most of the time when, when I've seen things like that happening, the SEO company also does sneaky things with their own website. So it's not something that I tend to see being focused only on customer sites. Usually they're doing all kinds of things to all of the websites that they're working on. Maybe it's not so directly visible on their own websites. But uh, usually, it's something that they're also doing on their sites, at least if they're doing this on all of the sites that they're working on. Sometimes it's also something that maybe a site that they're working on just has some kind of weird history, and uh, that uh, it looks like uh, this site is doing something problematic, but it's not really due to what the SEO company was doing. What about the opposite? What if you have a good customer site and they hire an SEO company that has lots of bad things going for them and bad associations, but they haven't necessarily encroached on the good site in that way yet? Will, will that single, singular association at all have any effects? No, no. That should be OK. We really try to look at it kind of on a granular level as much as possible. And uh, if these are individual sites that we look at individually, then those kind of associations wouldn't be a problem. It's a little bit different when we run into cases where maybe there are 10,000 sites that are really bad. And among those 10,000 sites is also this one site that was kind of OK, that was maybe from uh, the SEO or something that was kind of just borderline related to that site. Then those are the kind of situations where we look at a large batch of these 10,000 sites, and we see, OK, these all look bad, so maybe we'll apply manual action to them. And in cases like that, if uh, the webmaster feels that they were kind of wrongly associated with this big batch of kind of spammy sites, then submitting a reconsideration request is always a good idea to kind of get us involved in that again. 
Um, all right. See you, Ashley. Hi, guys. Thanks. Martin has a question in the chat. Are there two forms of reconsideration requests? I remember in a past Hangout, you mentioned a new form and a request that has a 10-digit ID. Um, so essentially, we have a kind of a webmaster troubleshooter, where if you go through that troubleshooter at the end, there is a chance to kind of submit something to a contact form, which also to some extent gets reviewed by the web spam team to kind of see if there are issues there that they need to be kind of telling the webmaster about. And that's probably what you're seeing there. So that 10-digit ID is generally a number that comes from our contact system where we see that where we can basically track that kind of conversation down again. But uh, most of the time, if you're doing a normal reconsideration request, then that's not something where you'd uh, get a direct response to. So that's not something where you'd see this kind of 10-digit ID. So basically, like this whole penguin and, uh, and, and then this whole panda thing, it's going to go on for like years to come, right? Like I'm just saying, for the, for the next you know, five, six years, we're, we're going to just go through this? Or are you guys going to just do this for a certain period of time and say, you know what, we cleaned house. We're done. Um, it's hard to Is say. It I mean, it's, me? Sorry? Is it up to a me to decide? Or? Well, I mean, these are essentially algorithms that we use to kind of try to bring quality content and relevant results into our search results. So it's something that uh, we'll continue evolving and working on these algorithms. We have a lot of people working on the, the search results in general to make sure that they're of the highest quality possible. So it's from that point of view, it's not something that we're going to stop working on and say, oh, well, the search results are good now. We don't have to do anything anymore. It's really kind of a case where the, the web keeps evolving, and we have to keep evolving with our algorithms as well. Right, right. And uh, there are sometimes ways that we can bring interesting results into the search results that don't evolve. Ranking, like uh, the knowledge graph things that we've uh, started doing. And uh, there are still a lot of things that kind of have to be done with the rankings as well, or which will definitely change over time with the rankings. So. It's not something where I'd say, well, if you understand how uh, web search and all of the ranking works now, you'll understand how it works in five, 10 years as well. It's just that uh, the web keeps evolving. And accordingly, we have to keep working on our algorithms to make sure that they kind of bring the results that users want to see. OK, thanks, John. Spammers will also evolve. Uh... Yeah. Yeah, I mean, th there are a lot of really smart webmasters out there, and there are a lot of webmasters that are doing a lot of really smart and uh, things that are very futuristic, in a sense. And uh, some of them might might be spammers as well. And it's something where we we have to find a, a balance as well. So something we're always working on, and it's. I think a lot of the changes that are happening are not even due to reactions to spammers, but it's just uh, due to reactions to the way that people make websites. Yeah. And that could include things like uh, making, making Ajax-based websites and making them kind of accessible in search results. And those are more the technical things. They're not necessarily things where site owners are trying to gain the search results, but it's just where they're trying to do something really neat and interesting for the user that, at the moment, isn't really possible in, in yeah, being, web search. Being different, just like uh, in the music industry, film industry, you don't want the same actor over and over and over again. Yeah. So same thing, yeah. Yeah. All right, I get it, yeah. I mean, it makes sense, you know, so. Yeah, keeps us busy. Keeps you guys busy, too, I guess. Absolutely. Yeah. Your customers probably want more and more as well, so. If a guy's spamming, then I would get a call from a client saying, look, you know, these guys, wow, you know, they're on top. But I said, watch, you know, give it like three, four weeks, and then the customer will call me back. Yeah, you're right. 
<laughs> I know, right? It's 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 short stuff. It's uh... yeah, it's sometimes hard to to find exact the right balance because sometimes there are things that we can take manual action on to kind of resolve fairly quickly, and other times it's something where we want to f work out an algorithm that handles it across all of the web. And those are the things that just take a bit more time. Not just one guy, yeah. Yeah. All right. So looks like we're a bit out of time. And um, thank you all for coming. It's been an interesting hanging out again. Thanks, John. Thanks again for everything. Thank you, John. All right. Have Thanks. a good week. Bye. Take care. Have bye. a great weekend. Bye. Have a great weekend, yeah. <laughs>